so this may be um, the HR people that you're talking to, but I'm going to take this down to the ground and I'm going to make it really real. And as we were going over, you know, what do you say about me? I get this long bio and Lord knows what it says every time I stand up. I'm like, oh God, no, don't say that. But in the end, I'm really in the people business. And I'm in the people business as we think about the next generation. And as we're here at Exponential Manufacturing, I actually was just um, at GE's uh, leadership center the, um, yesterday with a group of women leaders in manufacturing. And I think about exponential and what does that mean for talent? And certainly we just had a very robust discussion about, you know, don't let yourself get Uberized. And there's a huge element to that. But the last time I checked, it took 18 years to create an 18 year old. And in the end, the majority of manufacturers across the country, and I know I've spent almost every day in May on the road talking to groups of industry executives, is down to the lowest denominator of drug-free and attendance, and if they show up on time, I'll take it from there. So we as an industry are creating great wealth and the American economy yet we're down to drug-free and attendance. And I would argue part of the beauty of exponential manufacturing is it brings out what is sexy about manufacturing. So in the end, I always like to remind people of the why part of what I do, and it's because manufacturing makes this country. And I don't know about anybody else, but I'm done apologizing for paying more than any other industry, for having great jobs and benefits, and for building the nation's wealth. Yet in the end, we got a couple challenges, and one of them is actually why you're here, which is the disruptive technology and what it means for how we make things and how we do what we do. And therefore, what does that mean about the individuals? Because Marcus actually mentioned this, which is whatever we're training for today, whether it's in elementary school, middle school, high school, college, or a baccalaureate and master's degree, no matter what, the second they are done with that point in time, technology will have passed them. Because that's the exponential impact of how jobs are changing. Therefore, what does it mean about the world of people in a culture that still today grounds education in an agrarian calendar? How many of your kids are on the farm over the summer? Yeah, there we go. So we've got this technology disruption that's happening. We also have this dichotomy of increased jobs, decreased unemployment, and I'll come back to drug-free and attendance, and in some cases, just fog in the mirror. That's not really acceptable. Because as we equally have millennials as one of the driving forces in our industry, we also have this huge demographic cliff that's happening. And one of the fastest growing segments of our workforce is our aging workforce. What does that mean for how we do business? In many facilities, we have four generations, all of whom have a different set of values and a different set of expectations. And I hear a lot of discussions about generational gaps and the baby boomers and the millennials, and I would say no generation, just like manufacturing itself, is not monolithic. There are certainly indicators, and what I find really ironic about the millennials and the baby boomers is at this particular point in time, they want the same thing. They want a good paying job, they want to contribute the knowledge that they have, and they want to make a difference, and they want to do it on their time. Two ends of the same spectrum, and I'm that one in the middle. I'm just the compliant generation. We'll see what happens. So the other side of this is we've actually got a really big brand problem. Nobody really knows what we do. I'm a runner, so in every manufacturing community I go into, I basically lace up my sneakers. And in the process of lacing up my sneakers, I go out for a run. And it usually tends to be in an industrial park, and all I see is logos. Anybody here from Ohio? Driven down the corridor where Longenberger is? I'll be darned, but I know what they make. There's a big old fat basket out front. At what point do we start to celebrate what we do? Because we make life-saving medicines. We make airplanes that take us from one part of the world to another, and every piece in between. It's manufacturing that makes our world a better place. And in fact, I would actually argue, and back to the X Prize, every one of the solutions that faces our global challenges, as we're speaking to millennials, those answers are a manufacturing answer. Yet, the last group of kids that I had an interaction with and talked about it, you know, how'd you learn about manufacturing? We have this great video on our website about millennials, and actually it comes out of their mouth themselves. The Industrial Revolution. So as soon as Henry Ford comes back, we're ready. 
because we're teaching them in history class. We're not teaching them in what is today. I'm going to come back to that misperception. The really good side about manufacturing here in the United States is hands down, and this is a study that we do with Deloitte, almost all of our human capital studies we do with Deloitte. And in 2009, after a long time of looking at the skills gap challenges we had, we decided we were going to look at the perception. Why? Why not us? And what we found really interesting in the study, and we do it every single year since, is in the end, everybody thinks manufacturing is important. If they were to put 1,000 jobs in my own backyard, number one is manufacturing, just not for my kid. And pull in the millennials, and I didn't think we could drop any lower, but we can. 84% of our nation's manufacturers today have difficulty finding quality workers. Six out of 10 open production jobs, 80% would pay more. And I've been on a lot of stages where I'm either followed by or ahead of me is an economist who said, if I just pay more, we are so far beyond the rules of supply and demand as it relates to talent. We've got a public education system built on the agrarian calendar for kids to work on the farm, yet we don't have any farms, so what knowledge are they losing in the middle of that year? We have a culture in which success is defined by a four-year degree when the majority of our jobs are somewhere between a high school diploma and an associate degree and a four-year degree. And we can't get to the technical workforce if we don't have those middle skills jobs. So what are we going to do about it? The other thing we looked at with Deloitte is what does that look like towards the future? And part of that future is two million unfilled jobs. The other side of that equation is us. We have met the enemy, and it is us. Because if you look at the behaviors of how we're finding people, I call it phone a friend, pay a premium, or post and pray. None of that is how you manage your supply chain. None of it. We are absent investors in a $600 billion public education system that's turning out individuals that can't read and write. So who's our competition? Everyone. Everyone. So what are we going to do about it? On top of this, we have a changing culture. Another piece of information by Deloitte and their human capital trends. You know, one of the things we just talked about was the gig economy. The millennials aren't going to stay with us forever. They're going to sign up for a gig, contribute, and exit. I'd argue the baby boomers are starting to do this too. I want to do what I want to do. And that's OK if they're playing to their talents. So who is the future workforce? What does it mean when we're talking about disruptive technology? Proud of you, son. GE, manufacturer. Well, that's why I dug this out for you. It's your grandpappy's hammer, and he would have wanted you to have it. It meant a lot to him. Yes, GE makes powerful machines, but I'll be writing the code that will allow those machines to share information with each other. I'll be changing the way the world... You can't pick it up, can you? Go ahead. He can't lift the hammer. It's OK, though. You're going to change the world. <laughs> Just pick up the hammer. I actually was um, really excited to hear yesterday that they've got another Owen coming out. And I'm a, you'll see in a second, I have huge passion around the diversity of our workforce. And what I would tell you is, in the end, it is not just about our nation's youth, though they're a really important component we don't want to train them to pick up grandpappy's hammer. We need them to use their brains, not their brawn. So that's culturally different. But one of our best opportunities in the opportunity that exists today centers around it, groups of populations. Our new Americans are transitioning veterans. Best trained workforce, going to show up on time, have critical thinking skills. We're able to make decisions in life-threatening environments, yet everything we do in the hiring process likely screens them out. Because the language is different, and there's no easy way to translate it. But what I know about every one of your companies sitting in this room today is that you'll train them your way. Because that's your responsibility as an organization. I'll come back to another one of my great passions as a woman in manufacturing. We're 27% of the labor force in manufacturing, yet almost 50% 
of the labor force here. There are unconscious biases. Not a job I want to do. In the end, two-thirds of the women would say they'd stay in manufacturing if they were going to start their career today. How do we change the culture of what manufacturing is to be more inclusive? Because fundamentally what we know is the diversity of the workforce in a manufacturing environment, the more diverse, the more profitable. Come back to not just the diversity and the frightening statistic that was shared at the World Economic Forum in Davos last year, 80 years to equity. Somebody said to me, why do I think it's taking so long? Because equity isn't because I'm a female. Equity is because it makes business more profitable. The diversity of thought creates a better outcome for individuals and customers, let alone the buying power of women in this country and in a global economy. Yet not part of our strategy. Now I'm going to come back to lacing on those running shoes and running through the back roads of America and talk about National Manufacturing Day. The first Friday of every October is now National Manufacturing Day. And we're encouraging every manufacturer across the country to open up their doors and invite kids in and to show them the automation and the robotics. And I was talking to someone earlier today about what I love about additive, and boy, there was a great session on additive just before this. And what I love about additive is it democratizes manufacturing to the average maker, because I can walk into a Staples and buy a 3D printer. Now, I'm not going to mass produce on that, but the fact that somebody is thinking about tinkering that's the person I want coming in my door. So how do we excite them at the earliest ages so they don't wake up and think that math is hard? That all of a sudden math is linked to the reality of the world of work. Because what I know about young people, first and foremost, they're driven by experience. How did you end up where you are today? Who was the individual? In my case, I always give credit to Mr. Hard. Happened to be my fifth and sixth grade math teacher. And when I was heading from sixth grade to seventh grade and leaving elementary school to that big, scary middle school, that was a junior high in my day, Mr. Hard sent a note home to my mom. And it just so happens that my father has an eighth grade education and was a depression child, and my mother has a high school education and is a first generation immigrant, so English is her second language. And I happened to be the youngest of 12, two boys and 10 girls. And Mr. Hard said to my mother, whose checkbook I balanced, Jennifer's really good in math. You should encourage her. So no matter what happened and how bad I did in calculus, because you know it was an eight o'clock class in college and who really goes to those? I was good in math because Mr. Hard told me I was good in math, followed by mom and dad. And what we know is if we expose them to manufacturing as a career, it makes a difference. And in this case, this is the results, our national results for Manufacturing Day last year, focused on the educators. How many students does a teacher touch? Yet in the end, if they don't understand how you use math every single day, they're going to have an unconscious bias about what it means and what it takes. Yet 88% that went through facilities across the country understand the jobs in their community. Then in the end, we got a quality problem. And I'm going to come back to being a passive investor in a $600 billion public education system, which is incredibly complex. And I fully agree, <laughs> we got a long way to go before we can fix the systems we have. But blowing it up and setting it to the side is not acceptable when it's the reality of what we have. And we've got one choice, and that's to figure out how we engage how we effectively communicate what it takes to be successful in what is the most prosperous segments of this nation's economy and how you get it. 
because I'll come back to not only do I know every jo open job is costing you 11% of lost earnings, every bad hire is one and a half times compensation. You need to be active. You need to be engaged in first robotics. You need to be using industry certifications as part of that market signal. Because the IT industry does it and the healthcare industry does it and we don't. Yet industry spent millions of dollars creating standards like the certified production technician for our frontline entry level workers who, trust me, I talk to a lot of hiring managers and if they show up on time, drug free, know something about health and safety, the basics of material sciences, man, we'll take it from there because they have an interest in making something. So what's your job? When you walk out the door today, whether hiring is your responsibility or not is not an excuse to not be engaged. First and foremost, you gotta tell your story. We are only as strong as the least happy person in our company. And the people that should be talking about our brand that should be the ambassadors are the 12 million employed in manufacturing today. Whether they're women or moms and dads engaged in PTA or veterans, we're at the point where there is an element of retail to this. If you think about professional sports, they got a farm team. The recruiters for that farm team walk in your door every single day. And they're the ones that should say, here's what good looks like. You need to mobilize them and empower them to tell their story. And then in the end, you need to look at the hiring systems that are in place. Back to that gig economy. There is no silver bullet to this. Every one of you will be successful because you got a bunch of tools from which you can pull forward your solutions. Whether it's using industry certifications, starting internships, we have a lot of internships on the professional side and very few on the production side. Yet 84% can't find people. Get up, get engaged, and get involved. That's my hope. Thank you.